Welcome to In the Shadow Vil Duce podcast, a podcast on change and legacies in Italy. I am your host Diego, and in our first episode of this series, we will cover the rise of fascism in post war Italy and how fascism's birth impacted the nature of the regime that followed. We begin our story on the night of the 27th of October 1922. Reports from prefects or local government officials start flooding in of fascist squads attempting to seize control of key buildings in towns and cities across Italy. On the outskirts of Rome, thousands of fascists gather, ready to take power by force if needed. Panic sets in. The Prime Minister Luigi Factor requests that the King, Vittorio Emanuele III, declare martial law. The King, however, Convinced of his own powerlessness and concerned about the future of the monarchy, instead decides to compromise. A fateful telegram is sent. The king wants Mussolini to become the new prime minister. How did we get here? In less than three years, Italy and its liberal institutions went from winning a war to being ousted from power. This is a story of legacies. Liberal Italy was unable to run away from its problems and the memory of a brutal, violent war in which over 600,000 Italians were killed. Its past finally caught up to it on the 28th of October 1922. Why were the Liberals, who were the dominant political force since the early 1900s, so weak to begin with? Although they may have won World War I, they had lost the peace. The Peace of Versailles for Italy was a mutilated peace. The war had brought devastation to Italy. It had lost over 600,000 men, and its economy was teetering over the edge. Yet despite this huge sacrifice, Italy's claim for territories such as Dalmatia and the city of Fiume were ignored. The supposed weakness of the liberals to secure land fueled anger, especially among the nationalists. This anger accumulated with Denuncio's siege of Fiume in 1919. The poet Gabriele D'Annunzio, who had been a figurehead of the nationalists due to his strong support for Italian intervention in World War I, took control of the port city of Fiume and ran it for a year. It was theatrical, over the top, war cries rang out through the streets, and yet the liberals did nothing. This inability of the liberals to really do anything was the beginning of a long process of decline. Liberals appeared weak, incompetent unable to secure a hard-won peace or keep control of its own countries and border. However, another crisis was looming over the horizon. Post-war Italy saw a complete political breakdown of the previous political order. The old ruling class had been bitterly divided by World War I, and the hope for a new Italy led to the emergence of outside parties, the main one being the PPI and the PSI. The PPI, or the Partito Popolare Italiano, was a lay slash Catholic party, supported by peasants and hostile to the liberals. The days of the Gentiloni Pact, in which the Catholic parties allied themselves to the liberals to defeat the socialists, was a distant memory. The lack of Catholic support first significantly weakened the Liberals in the face of a resurgence of the Socialists, or the Partito Socialista Italiano, PSI. The Socialists were now much more radical than before the war. They had been empowered by a stagnating economy and widespread workers' agitation during the Bienino Rosso, or the two red years. Their newfound radicalism undermined any attempts at a coalition or partnership with the Liberals. All of this left the Liberals weakened and without partners. The Liberals, however, didn't really help themselves either. In order to try and woo soldiers, Catholics and reformist socialists onto their side, the Liberals introduced universal male suffrage in 1918 and proportional representation later. This backfired horribly. The Socialists and the PPI won overall over 50% of the seats available and the Liberal coalition was stomped, only winning support in the South and trying to rule over a divided North. It was in this divided period in which fascism was born and ready to exploit weakness. Fascism didn't have one definite beginning. It was born from groups, or fasci, of old army officers and soldiers disillusioned with the failures of the liberal government and seeking a radical future for a reborn, glorious Italy. Denuncio and the events of Fiume had inspired a generation of new nationalists, many of whom had fought in the war. The members of these fasci were primarily urban, middle class and students, especially the 20,000 ex-soldiers and officers enrolled in university. Despite hailing from different beginnings, they all had the same targets. Parliament, socialists, Catholics and bureaucrats. They were also united in their violence and impulsivity, something we will cover later in this episode. Now, why does Mussolini come into all of this? 
At this time, Mussolini, a former member of the PSI, was the editor of the Popolo d'Italia, a spokesman of sort for the discontented interventionists and ex-soldiers. He was well known amongst fascist circles and was the founder of the first Fascio di Combattimento, a group of radical ex-soldiers. Fascism of the first hour, as it came to be known, was a radical form of fascism. It wished to abolish the institutions of old, such as the monarchy and the senate, and institute a revolution. However, it had limited success. The revolutionary monopoly was held strongly by the socialists. Fascism was too decentralised, too urban to win support. It was still a movement and lacked any legitimacy. Fascism's breakthrough came with the Squadristi movement. The Squadristi were a paramilitary, essentially fascist movement led by nationalist ex-officers. Like fascism of the first hour, they were disillusioned and exceptionally bellicose and violent. They were based in the heart of socialist Italy, so the areas around Bologna and Emilia-Romagna, and soon became a plaque, killing it from the inside. These fascist squads were brutal. They attacked socialists and members of the PPI, and they burnt down headquarters, labour exchanges, and broke up marches and strikes. They were hired extensively by landlords, terrified of the Red Menace. They also gained support from many peasants and the rural lower middle class, who were tired of being forced to take on extra workers by socialist land leagues and labour exchanges. Through sheer violence alone, they turned Red provinces in the Po Valley and Tuscany into fascist strongholds. The destruction of the local socialist organisations also left the door wide open for fascist trade unions to expand their power. Fascism had also developed a labour branch who followed the ideals of national syndicalism, a right-wing nationalistic version of syndicalism that stressed the nation and the national community above everything else. They followed in the burning path left by Squadristi, taking on board the workers to the fascist movement. By 1922, the National Confederation of Syndical Corporations had over 500,000 members. Squadrismo gave fascism a new face. Even though fascism was born as an urban middle-class movement, Squadrismo transformed it into a mass movement, giving it a wide base ranging from small leaseholders and sharecroppers in the countryside to artisans and landlords. The liberals also began to cautiously flirt with the fascists, their anti-socialist policies could come in helpful in regaining their lost support. The fascist movement was gaining legitimacy and was beginning to embed itself into the Italian organism. However, the Squadristi had a much darker legacy. Violence. Squadristi didn't win hearts and minds with sunshine and flowers, but through despicable violence. Squadristi made violence both as the means to an end and the end itself. Violence and action had to be applied continuously, and not only once. There would be no compromise until the movement had gained an entire monopoly on power, and its enemies had withered away under its climate of terror. The Squadristi had first begun to normalise violence within Italian society and politics through a cult of minifragismo, or I don't care, I don't give a damn. Local prefects accepted, in some cases even encouraged violence to curb local socialist militancy. The violent breakthrough of fascism led to violence and oppression becoming a stable for the fascist regime, and a legacy that will continue as late as the 70s during the wave of black terrorism, something we will discuss in later episodes. As powerful and influential as the Squadristi were, fascism was still a movement and a long way from any sort of power. The Squadristi were becoming a threat both to Mussolini's role and influence and to fascist development. Fascism needed an institutional, national facade to penetrate Italian politics. Thus, in November 1921, Mussolini created the PNF, or the Partito Nazionale Fascista, the National Fascist Party. This put the movement onto a national political footing and created a centralised body under Mussolini which acted as a counterweight to the Squadristi, who were consolidating power as provincial or local fascists, under the command of the local Raz, or leader, such as Italo Balbo or Farinacci. By 1922, the PNF had over 300,000 members. It attracted many from the petit bourgeois and the middle class, afraid of Bolshevism and attracted towards fascism productivist policies. It attracted large numbers of youth, ready for adventure and embittered at wage rises for unpatriotic workers. It also crucially attracted large numbers of conservative and nationalists, who in the long run actually diluted the radicalism of the party. The fascist movement was slowly being transformed from a radical, violent movement into an organised, centralised national mass party. 
Status influences were strong, with the state being declared the legal incarnation of the nation, the promoter of national will and beliefs over the needs and beliefs of the individual. The fascist way to power would be one of infiltration of state institutions. Fascism thus overall became, to the eyes of many voters, a conservative right-wing party ready to restore order to Italy and fight back against Red Menace, and not necessarily a dictatorial authoritarian ideology. But, in my opinion, it is wrong to simply define the PNF as a conservative backlash against socialism. The very foundation of the PNF was a compromise between many interests, especially between the centralising forces of fascism, that wanted fascism to be centralised into a party, and the provincial forces, which instead wanted fascism to be more decentralised and spread across Italy in the local areas. Fascism was born as a piecemeal and uncoordinated violent movement. It was a local movement based on local issues, with every region, every province having its own fascism, leading to any attempts to centralise it difficult due to its often contradictory nature. Furthermore, fascism also replicated the general pattern of Italian politics since 1861, which were always dominated by local issues over rather national ones. Unity was only really achieved through the rough ideas of patriotism and nationalism, the PNF thus still retained a strong provincial and radical wing, still devoted to revolution and the overthrow of the old Italy. The Raz were extremely powerful during this period and continued their violent attacks on political opponents. This is clearly shown when Mussolini proposed a pact of pacification with the socialists, a peace treaty of sorts. This backfired and Mussolini was nearly overthrown. The provincial leaders believed that a position acquired by violence could only be maintained by violence. The PSI and its unions needed to be destroyed to allow for the re-education of workers in order to reunite them with the national community, the largest fascio or group. Thus, anti-socialism was just a jigsaw of a larger fascist puzzle, rather than its core policy or goal. The change from movement to party was a change that had many deep-reaching consequences and legacies for the regime. Its rather incomplete nature left a considerable amount of power in the hands of provincial fascists which hindered future efforts to integrate them, but most importantly in the long run led to severe and paralysing factionism between not only fascist party members, but between the fascists themselves and the state. This factionalism plagued the PNF for the existence of the regime, making sure that the PNF became incredibly unpopular and inefficient. The dilution of the movement into a more conservative party also removed large parts of its flexibility that had allowed it to be so successful. The movement was bureaucratised and the innovation was subdued. In the long run this made the party toothless and again unpopular in its mission to make Italians. We end our story where we began it, on the night of the 27th of October. Mussolini had risen as il duce to fascism. He had become the national face of the movement through his newspaper and had become the tamer of squads keeping them under control, but willing to let them wreak havoc if needed. In 1921, the fascists had won 35 seats, and a weakened Liberal Party was more than happy to attempt to involve fascists into government as a bulwark against socialism and as an attempt to tame fascism and its violence. The Liberal Coalition was extremely weak at the time. In one year there had been three governments, and all of them had failed to ensure any loyalty from the police, army and prefects. Fascism's rivals were weak, divided. Many of them trampled under the boots of the squadristi. The time was right to seize power. Fascism was by no means unstoppable, but the decisions of a few men changed the course of Italian history. On the 24th of October, the fascist congress at Naples met. 40,000 fascists chanted a Roma to Rome. The king's decision to compromise would be a fateful one. Mussolini arrived at 10.42am on the 30th of October and was taken to meet the king where he was formally asked to form a government. The next day he was appointed prime minister. Fascism had won and Italy would be forever changed. Mm -hmm.